Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church on this beautiful Lord's Day. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate our visitors that's visiting along here with our members. And you listening in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be a real inspiration to everyone. Let's take your Bible and turn where you please to Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to speak to you today pertaining to Noah's Ark. We find in Noah's Ark a beautiful type of Christ in many ways. We see our position in Christ. We're either in Christ or out. And you turn to Genesis chapter 6, the reading of God's Word. Now, this will be tape number 272. We'll send you a list of our cassette tape if you're right in and request the list. And we have many, many tapes listed. They're $3 each, and the gift is used to help defray our radio expense. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you tune in each day at 12 o'clock noon, WNGC, and get the daily broadcast, we're well, on Monday through Saturday at 12 o'clock noon. Of course, on Sunday from 11 to 12. We'd like for you to tune in and get the daily ministry if you can. The preacher telling me the other day, he said, Preacher Edwards, I saw a dear old lady, 85 years old, in the hospital that had AIDS. He said, in fact, she had one in each ear. So I'm glad it's no worse than that. You'll get it after a while. Just let it. Kind of sink in for a few moments. Give you time to turn to Genesis chapter 6 for the reading of God's Word. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shall thou make to the ark, to the ark and in a, a cubit thou shalt finish it above. And the door of the ark shall thou set in the sign thereof, with second law and third story shall thou make it. Now that's as far as I'm reading from the book of Genesis. and the book of Matthew chapter 24, the Bible says, beginning with verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, married and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We also find over in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, we find these words, the Bible says here in verse 18, beginning with verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 3, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long serpent of Christ. That happens the moment that you're saved, now we know, notice this ark here is a type of Christ in many ways. It was built by divine specifications. God told Noah exactly how to build the boat. Now God didn't call a committee. Someone said the best way to get something done for a committee when you have three on the committee is for two to remain at home and one to take the orders to do what needs to be done. So God called a man and his name was Noah. And God told Noah exactly how to build that boat. God had divine plans and specifications for him to go by, and he built it exactly like God said for him to do so. Now we know that Jesus Christ, our Savior, which is in a sense our ark, if you might want to refer to him as being safe in him, then he had a special birth, a special body. He was virgin born, and Jesus Christ had a special built body, Built by God, a body hath thou given me, O God, says the scriptures in Hebrews. And the body of Jesus Christ was a perfect body without sin. 
Jesus had no taint of sin in his body. He had a special built body. You must keep that in mind. And so we know then that the ark was built by special plans. And God said, Noah, build it likewise. Number one, we notice the ark had only one way of entrance. In verse 16 of the scripture in Genesis, it said there, the door of the ark shall thou sit in the side thereof. God said, Noah, I want you to put one door in that ark. There was only one way for people to enter in. They must go in through that one door. In John chapter 10 and verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And the only way you can get into heaven is through Jesus Christ, and he is the door. Now, someone said the Pope has the keys hanging on his belt. Well, if he has the keys, let him keep them. We have the door. Now, we can go through the door, which is Christ Jesus, and move right into Christ Jesus through that door by one spirit of you baptized in the body of Christ. In John chapter 19, verse 34, the Bible said, by, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Now when that soldier came to the foot of the cross, he looked up at Jesus. He saw he was dead already, and he took a spear and penetrated that spear into his side. And out came blood and water. Now, beloved, that, that door was placed in the side of that ark. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, by one spirit you baptize into the body of Christ. So when you are born again, when you're saved, you're placed in that body. And the phrase in Christ is mentioned 48 times in the scriptures. So you're either in or out. Noah and his family were either on the inside of that ark or on the outside. And they went from the outside into the inside, and they went through that door. Now, Jesus Christ is our door, and the only way possible to ever get into heaven is go through that door, and that door is Jesus Christ. That's the only way to heaven. No other name given unto heaven whereby you must be saved. It's through Jesus Christ that you go to heaven. If you go there, now no other way. You can't climb up any other way. If you try, you're a thief and a robber. And so Jesus is the door. And I trust today that you know him, that you have him, that he has you. And you belong to him. So there was one door, one way of entrance into the dark. There's only one way to heaven. Somebody said, well, we have different religions and different denominations. And, and we all have our different ways. And we're all going to the same place. That is not true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. So anybody that goes to heaven will have to go through Jesus Christ. No man can go to heaven denying that Jesus Christ is God. I was talking to a, a, a minister yesterday, and he made mention of so many of these people become involved in the Russellite movement. And you know, the, this cult denies that Jesus Christ is God. They said he was a God, but not the God. There's no way unto heaven that those people can go to heaven. They'll go to hell and burn forever in hell in the lake of fire. No way. Then get into heaven because they deny the way. And that way is Jesus Christ. He is the true God. That's the only way you can get to heaven. No cult, no movement that says Jesus Christ is not the true God, can go to heaven. They'll die without God. You absolutely block the way when you say he is not the true God. He is the true God. And so there's only one way in, that's through the door. God said, Noah, put one door in that ark and come in through that door, and they did. Number two, the ark had three stories in verse 16. With lower second and third stories shall I make it. I believe we find here a picture of the Trinity. I'm a Trinitarian. The reason I'm a Trinitarian is because the Bible teaches a Trinity. It's a great mystery we can't understand maybe as much about the Trinity as we'd like to, but we understand what God would have us to know in the Bible about the Trinity. If you read the book of God, you can't help but see there's a Trinity. One God subsisting in three distinct personalities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't have three gods. We don't have two gods. We only have one God, but three distinct personalities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God the Father is called God. Jesus is called God. The Holy Spirit is called God. And so there's no jealousy in the Godhead. 
And there's three distinct personalities uh, in, uh, in heaven. You need to realize that. They, they just in cry in the Godhead, I'm trying to say. And if you deny that, you deny one of the greatest doctrines in the Bible. We have a movement in this area that deny the Trinity. There's a denomination that denies the Trinity. And to do that is very dangerous. You're denying one of the greatest doctrines in the Bible. And it's not pleasing to God. You must remember that. Now we have the triune God. Of course, we have the three stories here. And of course, the way, way I illustrate it sometimes is like this. You have ice, you have snow, and you melt the ice and snow, you have water. You have the water in three forms. You have it in the form of ice, in the form of snow, and then if you melt the two, you have water. Now through this power coming into this church today, we have a current here. We get light, we get heat, and we get power through this current coming in. I, I don't understand electricity. I know if you don't abide by the laws thereof, you get into trouble. And many of you heard the old saying is, we can't understand how a black cow can give white milk and yellow butter. And yet we don't refuse to eat the, the good steak and eat the butter and drink the milk because we can't understand it. Now, because I can't understand electricity, it don't mean I'm going to sit around in the dark and complain about it. Now, because I don't understand, maybe you don't understand, oh, we'd like to know about the Trinity. That doesn't mean we're going to sit around and twiddle our thumbs and die and go to hell. I'm going to believe in it because the Bible teaches the Trinity all the way through the Word of God. In fact, man himself is a Trinity. Now, you here in this auditorium, you're looking at me, many of you, and uh, you see a body. That's all you see. But I'm a trinity. I have a soul and I have a spirit. Man is a trinity. He has a body, he has a soul, and he has a spirit. Man is saved by a trinity according to the Bible. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, and the obedience is bring to the blood of Jesus Christ. And there you have in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, you have the Trinity, a mention which is involved in our salvation or redemption. Now the Bible says the Holy Spirit does the convicting. He's the great high sheriff of heaven. He arrests that sinner. He convicts that sinner. He takes the word. He shows him that he's lost and needs to be saved. In John chapter 16 and verse 8, and when he is come, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin, the righteousness of judgment to come. He's a great convictor, takes the word and convicts that sinner of his need for God and shows him he's lost and on the road to hell that he might be saved. And then through that Holy Spirit, God draws that sinner unto himself. The Bible says in John chapter 6 and verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Jesus said, no man can come to him unless the Father that sent him draw him. And he does that drawing through the word and the Holy Spirit. And then the Bible said, Jesus saves. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, the Bible said, she shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. So the entire Trinity is involved in the matter of salvation. So you keep that in mind. Now we know man's salvation is in three parts. He's saved from the penalty of sin. He's being saved from the power of sin. And he shall be saved in the future from the very presence of sin. According to the Bible. There's a threefold coming to Christ. There's the initial coming to Christ. That, that is when you get saved. And there's the continuous coming to Christ. When you come to Jesus in prayer and so forth, there is the final coming to Christ when God calls you home. Someone said that man's heart is in the shape of a, a trinity. It's a, it's a, he has a triangle of heart, and a, then a round world can't fit into that triangle of heart in man. Therefore, he must have the Spirit of God and the Word of God because the round world doesn't fit into a triangle of heart. But the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and places the seed of God, which is the Word, into that heart. And so we need to realize that. Now, man's attacked by a trinity. We find that a man is attacked by the world. He's attacked by the flesh, and he's attacked by the devil. 
And you keep that in mind in reference to the Trinity. Many things you can say about the Trinity to illustrate it, and I hope I've uh, proven my point today. Now there are three persons, no doubt, living in many of us. The one we think we are, the one who people think we are, and one who God knows we are. So let's keep that in mind. Someone said that um, the fig tree represents God, the vineyard represents Jesus, and the olive tree represents the Holy Spirit. All through the Bible, you'll find the Trinity in operation. Trinity is in man. Man's attacked by a Trinity. Even the devil himself has a Trinity. There's a devil, there's a beast, and there's a false prophet. Now, they'll all be manifested during the tribulation period. There'll be the devil coming down to the earth. There'll be the beast, the false prophet, and they'll all be cast in the lake of fire. That's hell's Trinity. God said that would happen. Not only in the ark do we find one door, three stories, but we find one window finished above. Now the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. I think God wanted Noah to set that window that he might look upward, and God wants us to look up. Did you ever realize when you become confused and depressed and downcast when you're looking around you and trying to figure out certain things and circumstances, why it happened and so forth? That's when you're depressed. That's why God said, look up, get your eyes on God. If you set your eyes on man, man will let you down. If you begin to try to figure out circumstances and why certain things happen, you become discouraged. But the Bible said, set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is here with Christ in God. Now you need to realize you should look up, look to God at all times. The devil may warn you around, but he can't cover you over. You can always look to God. And you must remember that. Now look to yourself, and of course you'll be depressed many times. Because God says in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3, Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on thee. Look to others and you'll be distressed. Now God says in James chapter 1 and verse 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. So God wants you to look up. But you look to Jesus Christ and you'll be blessed. So you look to yourself, you'll be depressed. You look to others, you'll be distressed. You look to Jesus and you'll be blessed. And God wants you to look up. God doesn't want you looking around at the sad affairs of this world and try to figure them out and fit yourself in that category. God wants you to keep your mind on God. Everything you feed the inward man with comes from above. What you feed the earthly man comes from the earth. And God says, look up, you can't feed that inward man from the earth. It must come from above, from the word of God. And then we find something else in this ark I want to point out, and that is... Two birds in particular. Now they had other birds, they had animals and so forth, but there's two birds I want to mention because they represent the inward man and the outward man. The Bible said they had the old raven and they had the dove. That old raven, we might just call him a, a buzzard if you please. Now that raven represents the outward man of the Adamic nature. Now we find that Noah sent that raven out to check on the situation to see about for the water abated from the earth or no. And that raven went out and he didn't come back. Now the reason he remained out there is because he made himself at home. Every old dead cow he saw, he would light on that cow and peck away. Every old dead dog, all dead carcasses, he found himself at home out there. And he said, I'm not going back into the ark. He's a type of that Adamic nature, that outward man. That outward man, the world pulls for the flesh, it pulls for the outward man. And if you're not careful, you find yourself out here engaging in the evil affairs of this world and pecking away at the dead carcasses of this world. God doesn't want you to do that. The Bible says in Genesis, uh, Galatians, rather, chapter 6 and verse 16, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There's a constant battle going on between the inner man and the outward man. The outward man told you this morning that you shouldn't come to church because you're tired and, and you stay at home and rest and visit. That's what the outward man said. The inward man said, come on to God's house where you ought to be. 
Now there's a lot of people right now listening to the sound of my voice. They listen to that outward man. And they're now sitting at home when they ought to be in God's house. But there's many in God's house that listen to the inward man. And they came on to the house of God and followed the inward man in doing so. Now the Bible said in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 6, And he sent forth a raven which went forth and to, fro, to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the face of the earth. That old raven just kept flying around out there and making himself at home out there on the dead carcasses of the old world. And then the Bible said Noah sent out a little dove. And in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 9, But the dove found no rest for the sole of her feet. When that little dove went out, it wasn't concerned about lighting up on the dead animals and the dead human beings out there floating around on top of that water. That dove found no rest for the sole of its feet. Now that little dove is a type of the inward man of the new divine nature that God imparts unto you the moment you're saved. And it just couldn't be happy and couldn't be fed up on the dead carcasses of the old world. So it came back in. It found no relief, no joy, no peace out there. And you as a child of God, you may run out here in this world and try to find comfort and peace and joy, but it's not there for a Christian. You'll find your joy, your peace in the house of God, among God's people, around the word of God. You can't feed the inward man with the dead carcasses of this old world. Now Noah sent that dove out, the dove went out, and it came back again. Now, Josephus said he had a little mud on his feet when he came back. I don't know how true that is. But anyway, he sent that dove out the second time, and that dove came back with a little olive branch in his bill. He sent that dove out the third time, and that dove came back no more. Now, that dove there is a picture of the Holy Spirit. In Old Testament days, he came upon great men like Samson and David of old, and they performed wonders for God. Uh, that's a picture of the dove going out the first time. When that dove went out the second time, it came back with something new, an olive branch, coming from the beginning of a, a new creation, as it were, a new beginning for Noah and his family. And he brought that olive branch in, and that's a picture of the, of the Holy Spirit coming up on Jesus when he was baptized of John in the river of Jordan. That dove came and lit upon the head of Jesus whenever he was baptized. And the head of a new creation, Christ Jesus our Lord. And then we find that that dove was sent out the third time, and that dove came back no more. That's a picture of the Holy Ghost coming on the day of Pentecost to remain upon this earth till he finishes his job. He didn't go back to heaven. He came to remain upon the earth. And when that dove returned no more to Noah, that's a picture of what came, what happened on the day of Pentecost. And so we see the two little birds. We find the raven and the dove. The raven representing the old man, the Adamic nature, and the dove, the new man, the inward nature that God gives you the moment you're saved. Now, number five, I want you to notice the safety of this ark. God didn't say, no, I want you and your family to go into the ark. He said, come into the ark. Come the oil you lay in heaven, lay not give you rest, said Jesus. Come into the ark, said God. And Noah and his family came in. And the Bible said when they came in that God shut the door. And the word of God said when God shuts, no man can open. When God opens, no man can close. And they came on the inside of that ark and they were safe on the inside. No doubt there's a lot of people trying to hang on the outward side of that ark. But they fall off and drown like you have a lot of people today trying to save themselves. And think they go to heaven by doing good works and good deeds like a man riding a bicycle. they got to keep pedaling unless they fall. And they fell off and drowned. Now if you're trying to get to heaven that way, you'll drown too. You're either in Christ or out of Christ today. You're either saved or lost. You must remember that. And the Bible said that ark was pitched within without was pitched. And that word pitch is connected with the mercy seat. The mercy seat is connected with blood. Now that pitch kept that water out. And kept Noah and his family safe on the inside. Now you as a Christian today, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that keeps you safe in. And the devil is kept out by the blood. Now in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. If you walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. So Noah was kept safe in the ark by that pitch. No water could get in. You were kept safe in Jesus Christ by his precious blood. 
The devil can't get through that blood to touch your soul. If the devil ever comes through that blood, then he'd be a saved devil. And you can reach out and shake hands and say, Hi, you brother, let's have a prayer meeting. But he'll never get through that blood. It's impossible. And so you're safe by the blood of Jesus Christ. You must keep that in mind. Now this ark had its passages safe on the inside. And it landed every one of them safely on Mount Arad. Every last one of them. Didn't lose a one. Now the only place that Noah could have fallen would have been down among the animals. Down on the first floor. I believe Noah and his family lived on the third floor. Which is the type of the Holy Spirit. I believe they had the animals down on the first floor. The second. Maybe the animals on the first. The fowls on the second. I don't know how they had it. Anyway, Noah and his family could have fallen down among the animals. Like the prodigal son did when he fell down into the hog pen. Left the father's house. Went to the hog pen. And later he came back. Now Noah and his family could not have fallen out of that boat. They could have fallen down and lived among the animals down there instead of on the third story looking out the window. And we have a lot of God's people and they do it likewise. You can be in God's house enjoying the blessing of God and fellowship with God, rejoicing and praising God, but some of you have landed at the hog pen. And what you're doing, you're eating the husk and the swine doth eat, and you're miserable. You're not back in fellowship with God like you ought to be. Some of you out there in the radio listen, or you know you ought to be in God's house today. You're miserable. You've been saved, but you know where you are? You're at the hog pen eating the slop that the hogs eat. Now, you need to get back to the Father's house, eat some good old beef steak, and have some uh, good rejoicing with God's people. And so they could have fallen down among the animals, but they were safe on the inside. They could not have fallen out of that ark. Now, in John chapter 17, verse 11, Jesus said, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those thou hast given me. Do you think God might answer that prayer? There's no reason he shouldn't. Yes, he'll answer that prayer. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, he said, He that's begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Not hope so, not maybe so, not think so, but not possibly so, but he will perform it on the day of Jesus Christ. He that's begun a good work in you will keep working on you and, and perform it until the day of Jesus Christ when you meet the Lord in the air and go home to be with God. In John chapter 10 and verse 28, he said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hands. If you're in Jesus Christ, you're saved by the blood. If you're out of Christ, you're lost and on the road to hell. No, it is family were completely safe on the inside of that ark. God had shut the door. No water could get in. They couldn't get out. They were there, safe and kept by the power of God. You're saved by the grace of God. You're kept by the power of God. You must remember that. And then finally we notice the door was closed by the hand of God. In Genesis chapter 7 and verse 16, And the Lord shut them in. It is God that shut them in. It's the Holy Spirit that puts you in the body of Christ and seals you in. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God in the body of Christ. And the Holy Spirit, when he seals you in, no man can break that seal, not even the devil. You're sealed by the Spirit of God until the day of redemption. The same hand that broke up the fountains of the deep opened the windows of heaven and shut Noah in. You must keep that in mind. The same hand that shut Noah in shut the world out. The same gospel of save a life and life of death and the death. The same gospel today that will bring you in will push you into hell. You may say, preacher, what do you mean? All right, if you yield to the gospel, the word of God, and the Spirit of God, it will lead you to Jesus. But if you rebel against it, you find yourself uh, being pushed into hell because you rebel against the gospel of Jesus Christ. The same sun that will melt snow will harden clay. You must keep that in mind. Beloved, the same gospel that brings some in will cause some to rebel against it and die and go to hell. And you don't want to be among those that die and go to hell. You want to be among those that, that get in and come to know Jesus Christ. The same God that have mercy on you now will be your judge later. And you must face God in that judgment. God called for Noah to come in. And in Luke chapter 13 verse 25. Now listen to this verse of scripture. When once the master of the house is risen up and shut to the door. You begin to stand without and knock the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Now when God closes the door of this grace age. Nobody else is going to get into the body of Christ. Now, Jesus Christ is soon coming, and God is 
right almost ready now to close that door. God is, is just about reaching out to get a hold of the doorknob to shut that door. Now when God shuts the door of this grace age, nobody else will get into the body of Christ. You must remember that. If you're going to get into Christ, you must come before God closes the door of this grace age and the rapture takes place. And we want you to be in Christ. So you'll go up at the rapture and be part of the bride of Christ to be. Go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Come back down the earth for the honeymoon, millennium. And if you're not in Christ today, then you're lost. I don't care how good you are, how many churches you're affiliated with, how many times you've been baptized, how much money you may have. I don't care how popular you may be. If you're not in Christ, you're a lost sinner. And you're on the road to hell. A lot of those people back in the days of Noah, when they saw what had happened and God had shut that door, they came screaming and yelling at Noah and said, Oh, Mr. Noah, Mr. Noah, we've been a fool. We laughed at you when you said you were building a boat and God would send the water floated. We laughed at you, Mr. Noah. We're sorry about that. Won't you please open the door and let us in? Noah said, God shut this door, sir. And when God shuts the door, I can't open. Nobody else can open it. God will have to open the door. And when God shuts the door of this grace age, you can scream and cry all you please. Your loved ones will be gone on to meet Jesus in there and you'll be left here for the tribulation period. And there's no way you can get into the body of Christ after that happens. If you're going to get in, you need to get in now. Turn to God now because tomorrow could be too late. It's pointed them in once to die and after that to judgment. And I trust if you're not saved, you get in the ark today. Come on in the ark today. Will you do it? Let us all stand. I'm going to ask Debbie to come to the organ and Tony to come forward. We're going to give an invitation. And if you're not saved, you need to get saved today. If you want to come back to God, you may come back today. If you want to join this church, the invitation will be extended to you. You may come and join the church. Or for any other reason, God prompts you to come forward. I want you to do so. Father, I pray that you'll have your way during the invitation, that you use the message, that you speak it forth, God. Lord, to many people, that has fallen my lips, the words, God, and penetrated their hearts and minds, and speak to every soul in this building and meeting the radio listening audience. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Debbie, while you play your stanza song, if you're here without Jesus, would you come? If you backslidden, would you come? If you want to join the church, would you come? For any other reason, would you come? While she plays, we're waiting for you. This is your period of time. We're giving you ample time to respond. I hope you, you will if God's speaking to you. Just come right on obey God. If you want to join the church, I'm not asking you to come down here and give a speech. You come down, I'll take care of the rest of that. And just obey the Lord. Do what God tells you to do. How about you? When you come, we'll gladly help you. Brother Tony is right here to help you. Brother Carl is right here on the front, could help you. I'll help you. If you want to join the church, I'll take over and position you before the church. Be no problem. You either saved or you're lost. I don't care what denomination you're affiliated with. I don't care what church you belong to. You either saved or you're lost. No middle ground. You're either in Christ or you're out. And if you're in Christ, you've been placed there by the Holy Spirit the moment you repent of your sin and receive Christ as your Savior. If that's never happened to you, you're out. And if Jesus had come today, you'd be left you to go into that tribulation period. That's plain. That's the Bible. God's no respect of persons. Anyone, why wait just a moment? 